Well, I am excited to begin a new sermon series with us this morning on the Gospel of Luke. We will be in Luke a little while. Luke uh, takes up about 25% of the New Testament, so uh, we're going to spend some time in his Gospel uh, for the next little while together. And uh, this Christmas season, it's a good time to begin the Gospel of Luke. Um, We're going to be looking at the first two chapters Um, We're going to be looking at a little bit bigger chunks than we normally will these next few weeks just because um, of the season and and sort of what we're considering about the birth of Christ into the world. And so we're going to be considering Luke chapter 1 and 2 the next four Sundays, um, specifically around these four songs that Luke gives us in the opening chapters. The song of Mary, which we're going to consider this morning. The song of Zechariah, which we're going to consider next week. The song of the angels in Luke chapter 2, which we'll consider, Lord willing, on Christmas Eve. And then the last Sunday of the year, um, our brother A.W. will be preaching on the song of Simeon. And so that will be the end of Luke chapter, or the second part of Luke chapter 2. So this morning, we're going to look at the song of Mary, those three passages of Scripture that Jason just read for us, the opening four verses, and then the angel's visit to Mary in uh, Luke chapter 1, verse 26 and following, and then Mary's what we call her song of praise or Magnificat that comes in verse 46 and following. If you didn't pick up this morning one of the scripture journals but would like one of those, there may be a few more out there on the table. You're welcome to grab one of those. Those scripture journals are basically the gospel of Luke with some pages in there for you to take notes and write things. If you would like to have a copy of that, you may grab one. And then finally, a uh, final word, just a quick note. If you have your sermon notes in front of you, there are only three points to the sermon this morning, not four. So that's good news for everybody, isn't it? <laughs> Number one, let's consider three aspects of the good news or the gospel that Luke presents for us here in these opening words that he gives us in Luke chapter one. First of all, the good news is historical. The good news is historical. Now, who is Luke? The gospel according to Luke. It'd be good to know something about Luke, wouldn't it, before we get into his gospel? Well, from what we know from the New Testament is that Luke was a physician. Um, and as a physician, he no doubt cared about details if he wanted to be a healer and not a killer. Um, he was essentially a medical missionary who accompanied the Apostle Paul on his missionary journeys throughout the book of Acts. We see his name pop up pretty regularly. Luke wrote the book of Acts as well. He's a good candidate to write the book of Acts, considering he was there for a lot of it, accompanying Paul on his journeys. But what was Luke's job specifically here in the Gospel of Luke? Well, he tells us in the opening four verses what his job was. He's writing to a man named Theophilus, which just means friend of God, lover of God. Um, So it's really a uh, it could be a specific person, most likely it is, but it could it's also a general term. It's written to all of us those who are lovers of God, those who want to know who this Jesus was, Luke is writing his narrative about those things. He says in the opening verses that he's undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished, beginning with eyewitnesses and people who no doubt saw Jesus and interacted with him. And then in verse 3 it says, It seemed good to me, having followed all these things closely, to write an orderly account for you. Why? Verse 4, that you may have certainty concerning the things that you've been taught. So Luke is writing this orderly presentation of the life of Jesus to people who had heard about him in hopes that his writing of this narrative would give them increased certainty and stability about the things that have been communicated to them about Jesus Christ. So his goal, his job, is to compile an account of the life, death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ and to commit that to writing. Dear ones, the good news is historical. The Christian faith that we believe is based on eyewitness testimony and and it rests on actual historical events that really took place. When we come to the Gospel of Luke, we're not in the realm of myth or fable, or story, even though I might use the word story occasionally. It's a true story. But we're in the realm of fact and history. The Gospel of Luke has not been thrown together in some random way 
but rather it, prevents, it, it presents rather a careful sifting of the historical record to ensure that the truth of what took place is given to readers and preserved for future generations. As no doubt up until this point, largely this information about Jesus was being passed on through oral tradition. So why is Luke writing? Well, as I said earlier, it's to give us certainty. He says that word in verse 4. Behind the phrase that you may have certainty is a Greek word that communicates security, stability, and safety concerning the things that we've been taught. Luke uses the word certainty in two other places in the New Testament. In his book of Acts, in chapter 5, verse 23, we read this word in the following verse. We found the prison locked in all security, or securely locked. It's the same word. Certainly sealed. The other is 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 3, which Luke did not write, Paul wrote. But this word is used to describe the peace and security that will be given to the people of God even while the sudden destruction of Christ's second coming is all around them. So the idea here that Luke is giving us is that I want you to know that the truths that have been communicated to you about who Jesus is and what he's done are locked down, secure, unstable, unshakable, solid, stable, immovable. I want you to be persuaded to that. I don't want you to have any sense of wavering. These things are safe from being stolen, safe from becoming unimportant or irrelevant, safe from not being reality anymore. I remember Edith Schaefer, who was Francis Schaefer's wife. Francis Schaefer was an apologist and evangelist in the mid-20th century. And his wife, Edith, told a story of a person who asked her why she became a Christian. And her initial response was, well, because it's true. And that is the fundamental reason for becoming Christians, isn't it? It's true. It's not just because Christianity is a satisfying worldview, or it's a coherent philosophy, or it's a way that we have discovered a way to give a psychological balm to our guilt or a societal remedy that will help heal people and their families. It's because it's true. If it's not true, none of that other stuff matters. So when we talk about the good news, we're talking about something that's historical. We're talking about something that is full of history and truth and facts and events and concrete things that happen that form the basis of what God's doing in the world. God has intersected and intruded in this world, into human history. And so the good news is historical. Secondly, the good news is theological. The good news is theological. What do I mean by that? Well, I mean that it has to do with what God is doing. Theology is the study of God. Theological just means something that God himself is doing. Isn't that what Luke tells us in the very first verse? He says, inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that what? Have been accomplished among us. Well, who's accomplishing things? God's accomplishing things. The first thing I want to draw your attention to is that Luke makes it clear in this passage that this gospel, this telling of the good news that he is writing concerning Jesus is the story of God. It's what God is doing in Jesus Christ. This is his story. This is his plan. This is his purpose. Luke makes it clear all over the verses we're even considering this morning. Verse 26, Gabriel was sent from God to Mary and says, Mary, you have found favor with God. The Lord God, verse 32, will give your son the throne of his father David. Verse 35, the child to be born to you will be called the son of God. Verse 37, nothing will be impossible with God. God is at the center of everything that's going on here. So the good news that Luke is writing about is not about us. It's about God. It's not what we have done for God or will do for God, but what God has done for us. The story's mainly about Him. God is the main actor. He's central. He's dominant. He's all-pervasive. Christmas is about the creator of the universe 
who is not part of the universe he created, moving himself in the person of the Son of, the Son of God into the universe that he created. Now, how did this take place? Now we come to the body of Luke's narrative in verse 26, where we read, in the sixth month, that is the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, we will consider that next week, Lord willing, Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David and the virgin's name was Mary. And this angel comes and says to Mary, you found favor with God. And what was the sign that Mary was being shown favor by God? Well, that she's going to be a virgin who's going to give birth to a baby. The first clue that something really extraordinary is happening in history is the word of Gabriel that Jesus will reign over the house of Jacob forever and his kingdom will have no end. So this king that's going to be born to Mary is a kingdom, it will have a kingdom that will not ever be overthrown. Mary, Gabriel says to her, this is not going to be an ordinary son that you're going to have. This isn't just your son. This is God's son. Jesus will not be born by the union of you and Joseph. It will be be born by the union of you and the Holy Spirit. This is going to be a supernatural work where my spirit is going to replace the seed of Joseph to give you a son. The human nature is going to come from you, Mary, but the divine nature is going to come from the Holy Spirit. And they will be united in one person, whom you will name Jesus. Mary, you're going to contribute the humanity, but the Holy Spirit will contribute the divinity. And Jesus, the God-man, will be born with a divine nature and a human nature in one person. Does that ever get old to you, friends? I hope it doesn't. I hope that the realities of these things don't become just another yawn of the Christmas season. The Bible couldn't be clearer that the virgin conception of Jesus Christ, and that's how I'm going to refer to it, because it's not really talking about his birth yet, but his conception. The virgin conception of Jesus Christ is absolutely amazing, humanly impossible, but possible with God, and absolutely essential to our salvation. Now let's talk theology for a minute, can we? Since we're under the second point here, the good news is theological, we might as well get a little theological since we're here. Why is the virgin conception of Jesus so significant? Why is it so important? If we lose it, do we really lose anything? We lose everything if we lose it. Why? Well, the Bible is clear that we are all guilty because we are all born in union with Adam the first man. And because he sinned, Adam is our biological father, and we inherit his imputed guilt, both, his, both the punishment his sin deserves and the presence and power of sin in our lives. We get that at conception because it's biologically transferred. This is the doctrine of original sin. The upshot of this means that if there was no virgin birth or virgin conception then Jesus would have a human biological father through whom he would have inherited Adam's guilt, right? But if Jesus is born with the stain of Adam's guilt, then he cannot be the perfect spotless Savior we need. He would be an inadequate Savior. He would not be the Holy One. By the same token, if there were no virgin conception, Jesus would have inherited a sinful nature from his human father, And Luke is particularly at pains to point out that Jesus was born of the Holy Spirit. He was conceived by the Spirit. That is important because prior to the fall of Adam and Eve into sin, they were able to both sin and not sin. But after they fell into sin, they lost that ability and they were no longer able to not sin. All human beings... All of us in this room, including the one preaching this morning, inherit that sinful nature, making it impossible for us not to sin. However, the Bible also teaches that when we become believers, God puts his spirit in our hearts, and because of his work in us, it becomes possible for us not to sin. Not 
perfectly, but really. We are like Adam and Eve before the fall, capable of not sinning and capable of sinning. But if there was no virgin conception, Jesus, like all human beings, would be born with such a human nature that it's impossible for him not to sin. If that's true, then we lose the impeccability of Christ. That is, we cannot say Jesus was sinless because he would have been born in a state where it's impossible for him not to sin. And that is why Luke makes such a point of saying Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit. Jesus was born in such a way that it was possible for him not to sin from conception. Jesus was born of the Spirit so that it was rather than inheriting a sinful nature that made it impossible not to sin, he was conceived by the Spirit so that it was possible for him not to sin. But if there was no virgin conception, there is no sinless Savior. There is necessarily a time from conception in which it was not possible for Jesus not to sin. He would have inherited such a sinful nature from his parents. But as it is, the Bible's at pains to say that he was conceived by the Spirit, making it possible not to sin. Now, if Jesus was born to two biologically human parents, then he's clearly born like everyone else, and like everyone since. That is to say, he's born as a human being, a sinful human being. And if he has two human parents, he's not divine. If Jesus is merely human, then he can only pay for sin like a human can, which is to say, for one person, himself, finitely. But the punishment for sin is infinite. That's why hell is eternal. So if Jesus was merely human, even if he somehow managed to keep the whole law perfectly, and as we've seen, he wouldn't be able to if he was merely human, he could only offer a temporary finite sacrifice for a finite temporary person. There would never be a time where he could say it's finished because the infinite punishment for sin would never be paid by his finite human nature. But if we, so if we reject the virgin conception and the birth of Jesus, we reject a divine Savior with an infinite nature capable of paying the price for infinite sin. We are left with a finite Savior and capable of saving anybody, let alone himself. So, dear ones, I hope you see the danger that would come if we minimize. I don't think any of us are in danger of denying in this room. I don't think as believers, we certainly wouldn't deny the virgin conception of Jesus. But if we don't appreciate the theological significance of it, then we will lose a divine Savior. We will lose a sinless, perfect sacrifice. We will lose any sense of an actual sign that the Messiah has been born. And we are in danger of throwing out the entirety of the Gospels as untrustworthy. That's where the denial of the virgin conception historically has always led people. If, however, we happily accept that all things are possible for the God of the universe, then we can make room for nothing, who can can create out of nothing everything simply by his word, then a virgin birth and a virgin conception really isn't a problem for him, is it? It isn't. And I hope you see that even more this morning. So God broke into the universe... By doing the impossible from our perspective, he chose to be conceived in the womb of a virgin so that the fatherhood of this child would be absolutely unique. He would be the son of God, not the son of Joseph. He'd be the son of Joseph by adoption, which we will get to in just a moment as very, very important. But he, was a divine, he has a divine father, not a biological human father. He's therefore divine as God's son and human as Mary's son. Son of God, Son of Mary. God chose to break into the universe by choosing to enter through a virgin. Is all this sound too amazing? Too miraculous? Well, as Australian author and speaker Glenn Scrivener puts it, Christians believe in the virgin conception of Jesus by God. Atheists believe in the virgin birth of the universe without God. Choose your miracle. Choose your miracle. I'd rather believe that someone created something than nothing created something. Which takes more faith to believe. Atheists have too much faith for me to believe their positions. And as 
he has done all this, as God is accomplishing all this, he's doing it in fulfillment of promises that he has been making for thousands of years. That is crystal clear in these opening chapters of the Gospel of Luke. I'll just give you one of them in verses 54 and 55 in Mary's song. She says, He has given help to Israel, his servant, in remembrance of his mercy, as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and his descendants forever. So even though these thousands of years have elapsed since God's promise to Abraham, really since his promise to Adam and Eve in the garden, God has not forgotten. Because in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of of David. And that's why Joseph is so critical to this story as well. Because by Joseph, though he's not the biological father of Jesus, he is the adopted father of Jesus, and by being by adopting Jesus into his family, Jesus becomes of the line of David. This is why this is so important because you remember as we've been studying in 2023, the entire 1st and 2nd Samuel book that God made a covenant with David that he would establish his kingdom and his throne forever. And Jesus must be of that family if he is going to take that throne. And he is. He is of that family. God chose a human father who would be an heir of David. And since the days of Abraham, God had been preparing for this moment. So God broke into the universe, not as some generic human being, but as a Jew in fulfillment of 2,000 years of covenant promises to Adam and Eve, to Abraham, to Moses, to David. And now these covenant promises are coming to fruition. And this is all being done by the power of God. So there's your second point. The good news is theological. Thirdly, the good news is personal. The good news is personal. And here we come to Mary's actual song in verse 46. The song that she sings after visiting Elizabeth and having Elizabeth confirm to her that the the child she is carrying is God's son. And she says in verse 46, my soul magnifies the Lord. And the next 10 verses, that's all she does. Worship God for considering her and giving her the privilege of giving birth to the king of the universe and the savior of the world. So Mary exults. She calls him my savior in verse 47. My spirit rejoices in God, my savior, which implies that Mary knew she needed one. She knew she was a sinner because only sinners need a savior. And implicit in the term savior is the fact that we, like Mary, would be lost and alienated from God in our sin had not God sent us a Savior. We don't just need a little boost from God to get things right. We don't just need a few tips on how to succeed. We are hopelessly and helplessly lost unless God in His mighty power intervenes to rescue us. And He has. Mary was from a Jewish home. The Jews were God's chosen people. She easily could have thought, like so many Jews of her own day did, we're good Jewish people. We keep the Sabbath and we follow the commandments. That's all I need. Mary was a godly woman. But even though she was godly and from a religious family, she knew that she was a sinner and that she needed a Savior. She personally trusted in God and His Messiah. It's not enough to know God, kids, as your parents' Savior. It's not enough to belong to your parents' church. Christ must be yours, your Savior. That means that you see yourself as a sinner who's broken God's holy law. You stand guilty and condemned before His justice. There's nothing you can do to save yourself or deliver yourself from this. All you can do is cast yourself on the mercy of God and trust in Jesus as the one who alone can bear your penalty on the cross. And when you do that, you will come to know Christ as your Savior as well, just like Mary did. So why do we need this Savior? Well, Mary makes it clear throughout her song. First of all, in verse 49, she says, For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and what is his name? Holy is his name. This is why we need a Savior. God is holy. 
He's set apart from all sin. He's pure and good and without any defect or deficiency or blemish. blemish. And because He is holy, we deserve His judgment because we are not. Oh, but we think we're good. And this is why Mary says that He judges the proud. Look at verse 51. He has shown strength with His arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. Pride is what dominates all of our hearts by nature. We have a self-sufficient attitude that we can do it. The proud person thinks that he or she doesn't need God. Pride's at the root of all of our sin. This is why Peter tells us that God is opposed to the proud but gives grace to the humble. But God not only judges the proud, He judges the powerful. Verse 52, He has brought down the mighty from their thrones. Mary's not referring to faithful rulers who humbly serve God and their people, but to arrogant rulers who wield their power for their own advancement with no regard for the people that they rule. God is also not only judging the proud and the powerful, but he's judging the rich. Good verse 53. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. Mary's referring to the selfishly rich, those who live lavishly with no concern for anyone else, let alone the needy. But she's also referring to those who think they're spiritually rich because of their own righteousness when in fact they're spiritually poor. Mary emphasizes God's powerful judgments against the proud, the powerful, and the rich. He's going to scatter the proud. He's going to bring down the rulers. He's going to send away the rich empty-handed. What frightening words are possessed even in this song of praise. It's a reminder that Jesus came not only as a Savior, but to all those who will not receive him as such, he will come as a judge. God does not just ignore people or leave them alone. He scatters them. He brings them down. He sends them away empty-handed. You may ask, why does God do this? Doesn't he desire all people to be saved? Well, of course. He invites all. He invites you. He invites me to come and receive his mercy now. But we've got to come on his terms, friends. He doesn't negotiate or compromise with sinners. Either we bow before him as Lord, or he'll bring us down in judgment. So let me be honest. Not everyone in this room is currently living a life seeking to bring every area of your life under the lordship of Jesus Christ. We just call that person a Christian. But listen to me. God will be glorified in your life. One way or the other. You are made in his image, and he will be glorified in you, either by saving you or judging you. So make sure it's the former and not the latter. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, and God is more glorified in mercy than in judgment. But there is a terrifying expectation of judgment for those who cast off Christ's lordship. And I don't want anyone in this room to be among them. So look to God for mercy. That's why Christ came. This runs right through this entire passage. Verse 50. His mercy is upon generation after generation toward those who fear him. Verse 54. Mary says he's given help to Israel, his servant, in remembrance of his mercy. Mercy refers to God's compassion that is given to us in our misery as sinners. His mercy caused him to send the Savior. I love this. I love that we have in verse 49, Mary calling God holy, and then Gabriel saying to Mary in verse 35, I'll read it for us again, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called holy. We have a holy Savior who can help us. We have a one who can show us legitimate mercy as the Holy One. And here's the good news. All you need is need. And it's the hardest thing sometimes. But all you need is need. Mary says that God fills who with good things? The hungry. The hungry. To be hungry is to recognize that you have a desperate need. 
Relieving hunger is not a luxury. It's a matter of survival. Probably none of us have ever faced long-term, protracted physical starvation. Starving people aren't interested in new smartphones or computers or hobbies or what they're doing this afternoon for lunch. Well, starving people are interested in getting lunch here sooner, which I hope to get lunch sooner to you as well. That's a good thing. But we just want food. Where is it? And that's who Jesus has come for. Hungry people. Not necessarily physically hungry people, but spiritually hungry people. People who are saying, where's Christ? I want him. It consumes our whole existence from the time we wake up until the time we go to bed. Got to get food. We just prayed it this morning, didn't it? Give us this day our daily bread. We need physical bread and spiritual bread every day. And that's how we should hunger for God. And notice, God alone can meet that need. So we look to him for mercy. All you need is need, but God alone can meet our need. In verse 53, he has filled the hungry with good things. It's God who does it. And God does it through Jesus Christ. If we want to be satisfied, then we must seek God alone for the fulfillment of our spiritual hunger. He made us. He understands us thoroughly. He alone can meet the deepest needs of our human heart. So we recognize our hunger and we seek God to fill it. And he does through the mercies of Jesus Christ. And to seek it elsewhere is to seek what can never completely satisfy us because God alone can fill our hungry hearts. So beware of seeking satisfaction apart from Jesus. Satan loves to offer subtle temptations that seem to fulfill our needs, but they aren't centered on Jesus and they don't last. They satisfy temporarily, but ultimately they don't nourish. And we fill up and we fill up and we fill up and we keep starving and starving and starving. And God not only meets our need, but dear ones, he abundantly meets our need. Do you see what it says there? What did Mary say? He has filled the hungry with good things. God doesn't just give us a partial Savior. He gives us himself. He gives us everything. He meets our needs fully. It's the same word that is used when Jesus is feeding the multitudes where it says when everyone was filled, they had 12 basketfuls left over. Everyone ate until they were satisfied. God gives good things to his children, and he fills the hungry with good things. Isn't that a good Christmas invitation for us? God saying to us all over again, you hungry? Come and eat. I'll fill you. Come to me. Come to me, and I will fill you and fill you and fill you. So what, is, what effect then should all this good news have on us? What's the evidence that we have been affected by this good news? I think it's captured in Mary's response in verse 37. Before she sings, she surrenders. Look at verse 37 again. When, Ga when Ga the Ga angel Gabriel tells her this is how it's going to go down, nothing's going to be impossible with God, Mary says in verse 38, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. That's where all Christian faith starts. We don't get to the song until we get the surrender. The surrender starts first. And it's joyful surrender, isn't it? It's not God putting you under his thumb and saying, you will serve me or else. It's Mary voluntarily saying, in light of this good news, do what you want. And that's what we say to God. That's what it means to become a Christian. God, do what you want. My life is yours. Do what you want. Whatever you want is what I want. We take the pen that's writing our own story. We take it out of our hands, put it in Jesus' hand. You write it. Let it be to me. It's no longer a biography. It's a theography. It's God's story. Do you want God? Do you kind of want to be the main actor in your life story with God kind of as on a supporting role? He's one piece of it. Or are you committed, like Mary, to have a bit walk-on part 
in God's story, she had a little bit more than a bit walk-on part, but we, we have bit walk-on parts. In God's big cosmic story, that's the Christian life. We take the pen out of our hand. We put it in God's hand. We say, I want you to write me into your story. I'm not writing my own story. I want people to remember Jesus because of my life, not people to remember me because of my life. And Mary says, my spirit rejoices. And what that means is from the depth of her innermost being, even as she surrenders to God, she's exalting and rejoicing in him. She's grateful. Now, you might say, of course she's grateful. She's the mother of the Son of God. But have you ever thought about the danger that Mary is in right now? She's a young teenage girl in a culture where people who commit adultery get stoned to death. And everybody thinks she committed adultery. She's betrothed, she's engaged, she's not yet married, and she's expecting. You don't think a rock's in her future? It's going to bring untold disgrace on her. She knew that she'd be ostracized from her family, her friends, and that Joseph would probably divorce her. She has no reassurance from God that Joseph would receive an angelic visitation to convince him otherwise. And if Joseph had broken off the relationship, Mary would be forever stigmatized and financially destitute. It should not escape us that she's not in her home when she sings this song. She's visiting Elizabeth. Why? She's packed up and moved away for three months. Women don't pack up and leave their parents and their family and their dearest friends during their first trimester unless something's up. And that's exactly what she's done. She's left her parents and her family and her friends and she's gone far away from Galilee to her cousin Elizabeth and she's there for three months and it may well indicate that among other things that there would have been problems in Nazareth had she stayed. She faced at least ostracism, if not personal danger. But more than that, the cultural or social danger that she faced is that Elizabeth has already predicted, because she's to be the mother of a boy who was born to die, in the midst of this immense joy, she's going to bear the sharpest sorrow all her life. Dear sisters in Christ, mothers, If God were to announce to you today that he was entrusting into your care for a brief time a young man who was destined to go and die for his country in some other field of battle, that as a very young man he would die, and not only that, that you would see him die with your own eyes, and you were told this from before he was born, wouldn't there in the midst of your deep love for that son and your deep joy at his birth and your delight in the role that he would play and the sacrifice that he would make, would there not be a tremendous burden of sorrow that you bear your entire life knowing that's going to be his end? And yet Mary's grateful. She's thankful. She's an amazing woman. Now, every single one of us has things that we can gripe about, right? Got your list of gripes this morning in your mind? I've got mine too. All of us have things we can gripe about. Complaints about what we have in life, maybe even with God. I doubt many of us have the burden to bear that Mary had to bear because most of us aren't told ahead of time what's going to happen to us and when our children are going to die. And if she could sing a song rejoicing in God at his favor toward her, what excuse do we have? Are our lives really that bad? Encountering any social ostracism. Maybe that's why we're not so hungry. Pretty full on other things, aren't we? Christmas gives us an opportunity to get full on the right things. And to make sure that we have our hearts oriented in the right directions. And we're settling them in the right realities. Not on life going well, not on the ease, not on health, which can change so fast, not on family dynamics, which can shift so quickly, 
Not on marriage, which can go up and down. Not on our children, which grow up and leave. But on our God, who is always there. New mercies every day. Consistent provision. Filling us, caring for us, watching over us. Never changing. And that's where Mary locates her joy. My soul magnifies the Lord. And that's where our joy has to be located. And why does she have such profound joy? Here's where I'll close. How can she have such profound joy in the midst of all this distress she's experiencing? Her whole life's been turned upside down. How can she have such joy? How can she say, my soul magnifies the Lord, my spirit rejoices in my God? Look at what she says, verse 48. For, here's why, he's looked on the humble estate of his servant. That's why her humility. She's just a servant of the Lord. Verse 52, he's brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted who? Those of humble estate. See, God mentions that he exalts the humble because Mary acknowledges she doesn't deserve anything from God and that she would be given this great privilege, yes, that would include great suffering, but great privilege of giving birth to the Savior. She know that she doesn't deserve anything from God, especially an easy life. J.C. Ryle gives us some good counsel here. He says, let us rise from our beds every morning with a deep conviction that we are debtors and that every day we have more mercies than we deserve. Let's rise every day remembering that. We are debtors and we have more mercies than we deserve. And God will keep pouring them out. So humility is absolutely essential for everything in the Christian life. Recognizing that God doesn't owe us anything and has given us everything. That is the key to, if there is a key, that unlocks God filling our hungry souls with good things. It's that one. It's humility. And because of her humility, she's able to worship in the midst of distress. And because of her humility, she's able to embrace difficulty in the midst of of all these changes that are going on around her. And because of her humility, she is living in manifest surrender to God. That's why. Behold, the servant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. There is a bravery and a faith that comes in the soil of humility. Displayed by Mary as she shows that she understood the burden that she was going to carry, dangerous as it was going to be, was in fact the path to greatest freedom for her. One of my favorite hymns that we don't sing all that often, maybe I'll bring it back. Father, I know that all my life is portioned out for me. And I often think of the incredibly mature response of Mary when I read the final words of this hymn. And the fourth stanza grabs my heart, and I want to quote it in closing here. I remember exactly where I was back in the old chapel so many years ago when I first sang that song, and these hymns, that those words have never left me from that very moment. I remember where I was standing in back row and sang these words. In service which thy will appoints, there are no bonds for me. My secret heart is taught the truth that makes your children free. A life of self-renouncing love is one of liberty. Has your heart been taught that truth? Mary's heart was taught that truth. The life of self-renouncing love is liberty. You want to be free? Give your life over to God completely and let him do with you what he wants to do. And you are the freest person in the world. In doing the will of God, there is freedom like no other. In obedience to the word of God, there is liberty. And if we learn that at a deeper level, then we can learn to live. And we can learn to live into that song. Then we'll be able to sing Mary's song as well. And may God help us to do it. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the opening words of this gospel that Luke wrote under the inspiration of your Holy Spirit. Thank you that he wrote it for our certainty and stability. And thank you that we get a glimpse of what that stability looks like in the life of your servant Mary, who willingly, by your grace, received this mission that the angel gave her at your command to give birth to the Son of God and 
in all of her wrestling and struggle, she said, I'm the Lord's servant. Let it be done to me according to your word. And that resulted in a song that we still sing, reflected even in the words of Hannah. So many of the words Mary sung, had sung in these verses. One day, when she was waiting for a child of her own back in 1 Samuel, and you answered that prayer, and you sent a king named David to rule over the people of Israel, but he died, and he was an imperfect king, and he was a sinful king, and his kingdom, though preserved by you, also was detriment. His sin served to, to really decimate and split the people of God in the long run. And yet, we meet a man named Joseph who was of the house of David and we recognize that Jesus is that one who is going to sit on the throne of David forever. And we thank you that he is currently right now at your right hand, ruling and reigning, granting repentance and salvation to the nations. And we thank you that we are included in that. For any one of us this morning who has not yet recognized who this Jesus is and also what this Jesus demands of us. May we freely give ourselves to him this morning for your glory and for our everlasting good, knowing that you will fill us with so many good things, the chief thing being yourself. We pray all these things in the name of our first coming and soon coming Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's stand together and respond.